Hey guys, and welcome to Physical Geography. This class is about zoogeography, which is the geography of how animals are distributed across the surface of the earth. So to introduce zoogeography, we could have a little story here about a person who did zoogeography in the field, a guy named Alfred Russell Wallace, who was a British naturalist who lived right about the same time as Charles Darwin. He knew Darwin very well, and they discussed many things together, theories, etc. And this is the time when the British Empire was at its height. They had colonies all over the world. Remember, they said the sun never sets in the British Empire. And so he was able to travel around British ships and see different parts of the world and do field work about species, animals and plants. And one of the places that he went is called the Malay Archipelago. Archipelago is a, a cluster of islands. And so all these islands that you see here, which are now different countries like the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Little Brunei, those are all part of the Malay archipelago, the Malay people who are from those areas, the islanders. So Alfred Russell Wallace spent eight years, uh, literally and figuratively, floating around the Malay archipelago, studying species. And that experience of seeing all these tropical species, notice that it's right at zero, it's right along the equator, this area, it's very hot, very humid, very tropical. All that experience gave him a lot of interesting insights that helped him formulate theories. And he eventually, along with Darwin, co-discovered the theory of evolution. Okay, so they both kind of did it on their own, but by talking to each other and discussing things. But they both really came up with the theory of evolution, not just one or the other, even though Darwin is usually the person that gets credit for that. So Alfred Russell Wallace was a zoogeographer, among other things. He came up with a map that showed a line that he noticed in the Malay archipelago, and it's called Wallace's Line. And he noticed that there's a certain group of species of animals that you find on these islands, which are all chopped up in many, many different islands. Indonesia has 11,000 islands. Philippines has over 8,000 islands. And he noticed there's a point where that red line is where the species on one side, the oriental species, or the East Asian species, Southeast Asian species, they just kind of uh, go up to that red line alone, pure. It's all them, all the species. But then as soon as you cross that red line, you start getting species from the Australian region as well, the Australian zoo regions that you get mixed in there. So that middle area there where it says Wallacea, that middle zone, that's like a mixture of Australian in oriental zoo regions. And then you cross the black line, later someone else, Weber, came up with the black line, a German, and uh, that's where the oriental species fizzle out and they no longer exist after the black line. You just have Australian species. So these guys are putting lines on maps to try to delineate where a certain group of animals can be found, where that starts to mix with another group of animals, and then where that second group of animals sort of takes over. And that's all an example of zoogeography. So we can define zoogeography as the study of the spatial distribution of species on Earth. Remember, geography is about what is where, why, and so what. So it's where are the animals? Right? What are the animals? Where are the animals? Why are the animals where they are? And so what? And the world is divided up into a number of zoogeographic regions, usually six or seven. These are areas of the world that have a distinct pattern of animal life that's different from the others. Some of them are huge. And like at the top, you have the whole Arctic region, which we live in in North America up here, in, uh, Europe, et cetera. See the pink, red, it's whole Arctic. But then other ones are very much, you know, much smaller than that, but at the same time, very distinctive, like Madagascar over here. It's so unusual. But even though it's relatively small compared to the others, it has its own zoo region. So before we get into the different zoo regions, we're going to go one by one through the regions and see kind of the lay of the land, what's there. Let's talk about a couple different terms we can use to describe the species distribution. If you say something is a cosmopolitan species, that means that that species is distributed in most areas of the world, most regions or sometimes all regions of the world, depending on the species. 
for example, humans. Humans can be found on many different continents, wolves, different types of wolves, right? You have uh, wolves like timber wolves in, in colder areas, and you have uh, warmer weather wolves. Whales, sharks, cats, and dogs, these can be found in many different parts of the world. So they're cosmopolitan species. By contrast, the opposite of cosmopolitan species would be endemic species, which means that a species is only located in a particular or specific area of the world and does not occur naturally anywhere else. Now, if it's in a zoo somewhere else, someone caught one and then brought it somewhere else, that doesn't count. That's not part of the calculation. So, for example, giant pandas that you see there on the bottom left are endemic to China and even certain parts of China, like the Sichuan Basin, for example. That bird on the right, the Kagu bird, is endemic to a little set of islands in the Pacific Ocean called New Caledonia, a former French colony. And even there, it only is endemic to the mountain forests of those islands. So you can have a species be endemic to a continent or a set of mountains or even a particular forest. There are some species that are only found in that forest, for example, that river. And species like that, you often call them narrow endemic, meaning a very narrow range that they live in, very narrow territory on Earth that they're endemic to. So the two ends of the spectrum are cosmopolitan species found in many areas of the world versus endemic species, which are located only in specific areas. A species geographic range is the spatial extent of where it lives. So how wide of an area, where's the territory where I can find this species? So you see in this map, for example, this is the range of the barred owl. There's the barred owl on the right. And then that brown area there is where you could find the barred owl within North America. And just to be clear, it doesn't mean that every single place that's brown on the map, there's a barred owl there, obviously, right? It just means that that's the limits to the territory, the range where you can find the barred owl. That's how far it ranges out. That species range will change over time due to many different factors, due to natural factors, you know, the ice age, ice will come in and cover whole areas or climate changes things, gets too hot, gets too cold, gets too wet, gets too dry, but also because of human factors. It could be that humans paved over its part of its environment and its uh, habitat, and now it's a parking lot, you know, or whatever it might be. So a good example of that is the African lion, which you see picture on the left, the past distribution, which is red, which is a very wide distribution, and then the current distribution is green, obviously much smaller, right? So that's due to the population of Africa. Everybody has been populated. Many cities and human-built environments have been created where lions can no longer live. And people have also hunted lions too. So the combination of those things, along with some just habitat destruction, there might've been other ways that their habitats have been destroyed, has left the uh, African lion with a much smaller distribution that it had originally. So a much smaller range. And just to be clear, the flip side of that is other species might have a range that explodes or get much, much bigger. You know, so for example, invasive species, um, you know, like kudzu, the, the vine that grows, it's from Japan and it came to the United States and went crazy in the South and it's all over the place. That species range has not shrunk, it's actually grown a lot. So a species range can expand or it can also shrink or it can stay the same or just move somewhere else. It just depends on all the different factors involved. So let's do a run through these different zoo regions around the world. And we're just gonna get some of the highlight reel of all of these. There's obviously a lot we could say about many different zoo regions, but we're just gonna get kind of the overview. And we'll start with the African zoo region. Obviously Africa is famous for animals and it has the most large mammals of any place on earth large mammals. So mammals are species that give birth to the young. Talking about things like elephants and giraffes and lions and leopards and gorillas and things like that. And especially it has a huge variety of ungulates. Ungulates are animals that have hoofs. So not just horses and goats, but also elephants and rhinos and hippos and, and giraffes and gazelles and zebras doesn't all have hoofs, right? So lots of different types of ungulates. We could fill a whole class for the whole year with 
the different species in the African zoo region. But a couple of things I can say is that on the one hand, all these animals, they bring a lot of money to Africa for tourism, for people to go on safari and see all these species, right? So there's a lot of uh, money coming into Africa to see these animals, to the hotels and all that stuff. And it's not cheap. Oftentimes these parks cost 50 bucks, $100 to get in there sometimes or more. Um, but also a downside to having so many huge species in Africa is that they tend to be sort of disease magnets, meaning big animals can carry diseases in them and survive, but then other animals that are smaller can get those diseases through vectors, you know, like uh, insects that go back and forth, like the tsetse fly or et cetera, different types of insects that carry a disease. So this is one reason why people have difficulty settling some areas of Africa, you know, for farming and stuff is because there's so many animals uh, that carry diseases around that if you go too close to those animals for too long, you start to get the diseases from the animals. So that has made humans kind of stay away from, you know, certain wildlife over many, many centuries. Off the coast of Africa is Madagascar, which broke off very early in the separation of the continents after Pangaea. It was relatively early that Madagascar broke off by itself. So it's just kind of been out there. And some species are isolated on Madagascar. It's a very unusual place. 90% of the species in Madagascar are endemic to Madagascar, meaning you don't find them naturally anywhere else. And one of the most famous of those is lemurs. Like you see on the left, there's many different types of lemurs, but lemurs are endemic to Madagascar. But many other species of animals and plants and insects are also endemic to Madagascar as well. It's not just animals, it's not just lemurs. And the question is, how did the species get there? Were they already there and it broke off with them on it, kind of like they were on a boat and the boat you know, left the harbor and out in the ocean now? Or what? Well, how did they get out there? And that we'll talk about in a little bit. Moving away from Africa, we have the whole Arctic zoo region. That's the one we live in, whole Arctic zoo region. And it's a huge region of the world, but it's got relatively low biodiversity compared to, say, Africa, Madagascar, or something like that, because of a couple of reasons. One, it was under ice during the ice age, not all of it, but a large part of it. And so when the ice came down and talking about kilometers thick ice, well, many species could no longer live there and they were forced to move. They often migrated to the south and maybe sometimes stayed there. Sometimes they came back, but other species also went extinct. So species had to either move or go extinct when the ice covered large areas of the whole Arctic. So the species that we have in the whole Arctic zoo region today, especially in the Northern parts, you know, like upstate New York or Ireland or something, those would be actually species which came relatively late in history. They came in there after the ice left. They kind of came back or they came in for the first time. The sort of relative newcomers in the grand scheme of things since Pangaea. So we have bears and wolves and fox and moose and wolverines and otters and many other species in the whole Arctic zoo region. The neotropical zoo region is a whole other story from the whole Arctic. It's a high diversity region. This is where you find the biggest areas of tropical rainforests in the world. So you notice it says neotropical. Neo means new. So it's like the new world, the Americas, you know, as opposed to Europe, the old world. So the neotropical region is like the rainforest areas of the Americas and South America as well. Not all just rainforest, other things too. So you have the Amazon, you have the rainforest of Central America, very high biodiversity, extremely high number of migratory birds. Many of those birds then fly to Canada, let's say, for the summertime or somewhere far away to uh, lay eggs, hatch, and then they all come back for the wintertime, back to the warmer areas. And it also contains the world's largest swamp, basically, the Pantanal. So the Pantanal, in Spanish, Pantano is swamp, right? And so Pantanal is like the big swamp. So this huge area in the middle of South America on the border of three different countries, it's where Bolivia, Paraguay, and Brazil all meet, and it's called the Pantanal, the big swamp. 
and it is the world's largest wetlands. Wetlands is things like swamps, marshes, um, fens, bogs, different types of environments which are spending uh, at least half of the year underwater. It's like a big puddle sort of for large parts of the year. And so the type of species that live there are able to live in this very soggy water covered environments. It's difficult for humans to live there. It's very humid and tons of you know, mosquitoes and insects and things like that. But it's very rich in animal life, including that piranha that you see on the bottom, which are carnivorous fish. Now, just to aside in South America, they do actually eat piranhas sometimes. If you take an Amazon cruise or something, which I have not, but I've heard of people who did, and they told me that they pull piranhas out of the Amazon and then they eat piranha soup. So that's something that you can look forward to doing. Um, if you ever go on an Amazon cruise, you can ask for the piranha soup. I did have alligator once. I went to Paraguay and I found a restaurant in uh, Asuncion that had alligator on the menu. I had to try it. I won't say it was very good. It kind of tasted like rubber, but at least I had alligator. The neotropical zoo region, we said, has lots and lots of migratory birds. And like we said, they often go out of the neotropical regions to areas that are normally colder, but they go there during the summertime where it's briefly warmer, and then they come back. And so um, even in Virginia, on the bottom right there, for example, if you look at the map, you see the Virginia Eastern Shore, which is the part of Virginia that's across the Chesapeake Bay, kind of hanging off of Maryland there. They actually are a stopover for a huge number of neotropical birds. It's, a, it's like a stopping point on the migration north-south of all those birds. So there's a particular time of the year in the fall where they all show up. So if you're interested in that stuff, it's worth checking out uh, when to go there. You can find these birds show up at the Eastern Shore of Virginia National Wildlife Refuge or Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge. There are a lot of funky species as well in uh, South America in the neotropical zoo region in general, partly because South America, if you go back to Pangaea, it was actually separated from North America for uh, millions of years. And so species developed in isolation there. Uh, you have all the camelids, like the alpacas and the vicuñas and the llamas and the guanacos and the different sizes of camelids. You have these funny animals called tapirs, which sort of have a floppy nose and kind of like a pig with a big floppy nose like that. And then you have the world's largest rodents called capybaras, which are sort of the size of a medium dog or maybe even a larger dog. And they are also known as chiwiros in South America. Capybaras are like uh, sort of that waterproof uh, pelt, waterproof uh, fur on the outside. So these are unusual species that you find in the neotropical zoo region and they are confined to that area they're not found in north america so they didn't basically they didn't make it past central america in the on the map and we'll see in a moment that that's because there was a sort of a natural filter there in central america which prevented them from passing through let's go to the other side of the world the land down under we have australia the australian zoo region and that zoo region is extremely distinct because Australia is separated very early from the other continents. And so it has a very, like, like Madagascar, has a very high number of endemic species that are only found naturally in Australia. And that especially um, is a place where you can find marsupials. Now, marsupials are not only found in Australia but many types of marsupials are, like kangaroos only found in Australia, koalas only found in Australia, wallabies only found in Australia. Marsupials actually come from South America, believe it or not, I'm talking about going way, way back in geologic time. And they actually crossed over from, if you can believe this, uh, marsupials crossed over from South America across Antarctica when Antarctica was green walked across in the other side and go, went on to Australia when it used to be attached to Antarctica and showed up there, then evolved into these other species that we see here. So there are still a few marsupials left in South America, but um, the majority of them now in Australia. 
there's an island off the coast of Australia called Tasmania. And sure enough, it's home of the Tasmanian devil, like the cartoon, uh, which is a marsupial as well, but it's carnivorous. Uh, speaking of carnivorous, uh, you can actually get kangaroo meat burgers um, in Australia. Kangaroos are, are, are a very interesting species, but they're not in danger. There's lots of kangaroos out there. There's lots of kangaroos. So they, uh, um, they do have... You know, some people farm kangaroos and and, uh, and produce meat from kangaroos, and you can eat that. I don't know if it's the most popular thing, but it's something you can do. Uh, speaking of that, you can actually eat those capybaras that we saw above. They sell capybara steaks in uh, Colombia as well. So it's red meat, so something to think about before you go to Colombia uh, or Venezuela too. And marsupials, what are they? They're animals that carry their young in pouches. So they give birth, but then that uh, baby is not prepared to go out on its own, and, you know, uh, like some other mammals. And so they have to kind of have a incubation stage in the pouch until it's ready. And so from the Australian zoo region, we can go to the New Zealand zoo region, which you'd think would be, you know, maybe you'd think, pretty similar to Australia because aren't they all kind of the same down there, Australia, New Zealand. But it turns out that Australia and New Zealand are very far apart. If you look at the map, there's a long distance between them. They're not like next to each other. They're very far apart. New Zealand is way out there on its own. And the New Zealand zoo region is extremely unusual because it is dominated by birds, but not only birds, flightless birds, flightless birds. There are very few natural mammals and very few natural reptiles on uh, New Zealand. Now, today, New Zealand is a huge dairy and wool producer. They have lots and lots of sheep and cows that they brought in from other places because it was part of the British colonies for a while. But Australia, too, is also a huge producer of dairy products and wool. But those aren't obviously native to that area. So... What is native to that area are these sort of roly-poly flightless birds, flightless birds like the takahe and the national bird of New Zealand, which is the kiwi, kiwi bird, which has a long, long beak and it's sort of roly-poly and it's got these little uh, holes at the end of that beak, which you can smell with actually down in holes and, and stuff like that. So you can reach deep into holes and smell in there and see what's going on and get food. The kiwi is so... Uh, essential to New Zealand that it is um, the symbol on the dollar coin. It is the symbol on that stamp right there going back over 100 years. And not only that, it's what you call somebody from New Zealand. If you say this guy's a Kiwi, it means this person's from New Zealand. Those flightless birds that we talked about include penguins. It is like the penguin capital of the world. And it's also a big sailing country, too. It's more sailboats per person than any other place in the world. So uh, you can find lots and lots of penguins in New Zealand. It's not the only place you can find penguins, but they, too, are among the flightless birds found in the New Zealand zoo region. So that's a basic overview of these zoo regions. There's a few that we didn't go over in the cracks there, but you can explore those on your own. And now that we've seen that, let's now look at some of the ways that these species move around from place to place, because these zoo regions didn't just come out of thin air. They were created by the movements of species and the evolution of species over millions of years. So we can look closely at corridors, ways that animals can move from place to place so that they end up in new places and become part of that zoogeographic region. So the general name for a pathway that animals can use to migrate between habitat one and habitat two, whether it's short distance or long distance, is called a corridor, wildlife corridor. And so they use the corridor to go from one habitat to another, but at the same time, the corridor itself is a habitat, meaning, right, because they're living in the corridor as they're moving through the corridor. For example, some birds travel for thousands of miles in a corridor, so they're in there for, for months at a time. So that's the habitat as well. So let's look at a couple different types of wildlife corridors. First type we can look at is called a filter corridor, which is 
just like it sounds. It has the ability to filter out certain species to prevent certain species from getting through and then to allow others to get through, right? Just like, you know, a coffee filter or air filter, some stuff gets through and then some stuff doesn't get through. It gets trapped in the filter. So one example of that would be during the ice age when more water in the world from the oceans was locked up in ice instead, then the oceans went down and that actually exposed a piece of land that you see on the slide here, the Bering Strait was covered in the Bering Land Bridge. So you could actually, some species could walk from Asia to North America or vice versa. And if you look closely at this picture here, it's kind of amazing. For example, did you know that camels, right? Camels are actually an American species. That's why we have camelids like alpacas and llamas in South America. They're actually, that's where they're from. They're from the Americas, camelid species. And the camels crossed this Bering land bridge long ago. And during the ice age, it came out the other side in Asia and made their way all the way over to the Middle East, where now they're in Saudi Arabia and stuff like that. So it's been a long journey for camelids. And meanwhile, going the other way, some of the quintessential American species that we think of, like the bear and the bison and deer, things like that, in here, well, those are Asian species. And they were able to cross the Bering Land Bridge going the other way. So you see the bison, the bear, the deer, they started in Asia. They came to America during the Ice Age as well. And now we think of them as common American species. So really, the species that we see today, it's just fascinating to think how hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago, that species was living somewhere, or, or you know, its early ancestors were living in some completely different part of the world and somehow slowly but surely made it over to where it is today. Another example of a filter corridor is Central America and specifically uh, Panama, especially, because if you look on the map here, the Panama land bridge, which is basically now the country of Panama, is the skinniest part of Central America there. So it's very difficult to get through there because even now, Panama is covered in many mountains, a couple of volcanoes, and a lot of rainforest. But back then, it was you know all like that. There were no cities or roads or clearings that you could go through as an animal. So this uh, skinny little land bridge of Panama acted as a filter for all the species of North America that might want to go to South America, that might be trying to get through there, it filtered many of them out, meaning they just could not get through that super dense vegetation. They couldn't cross those huge mountains. And vice versa, kept a lot of species from South America from migrating north, same thing. But that's not to say that no species was able to cross from South to North. Some could, meaning that there were South American species which were able to make it North. And there were North American species that would make it to South America through that filter. Some did. For example, you see these giant armadillos. And we know there's like armadillos in Texas and things like that. Um, you see camelids up here and they made it to South America to become llamas, etc. But this too is fascinating. It's called the Great American Interchange or just the Great Interchange. And it's an exchange of species, a movement of species between North and South America across and through this filter corridor, which is Central America. And one of the things that makes this even more amazing, because first of all, it was so difficult to get through all that you know, difficult terrain and vegetation of Central America, but these species were large, like XXXXL, like much larger than we find today. So on the left, for example, you see this glyptodon, this giant armadillo that's bigger than people. And so some of the very first Native Americans who came also over that Bering Land Bridge during the Ice Age, they came from Asia too. They went into North America. That's how human beings arrived in the Americas was over that land bridge across the Bering Strait during the Ice Age. And one of the things that they would have found were giant armadillos like this. Today, we're surrounded by, you know, the species that we see, you know, dogs and cats and raccoons and rabbits or whatever. But humans aren't necessarily always evolved to just see all the kind of medium and small stuff. 
we're also evolved to see the big stuff too. I mean, humans hunted mammoths and, you know, these, these giant animals like this. So it's something I think is interesting to think about is how human beings today, we lack something that was not only part of the environment in the past, these giant animals, but it was a very important part of the environment because it was one of the biggest threats to humans was these huge animals. You wanted to know if a mastodon is coming. It's interesting to think that a lot of us, I think, are minds are wired to see big you know to see things big to see big animals and stuff and they're not there do you know what i mean so in other words it's we're, we're missing something in our lives and so maybe we replace it with something else we have movies with special effects with with giants you know and transformers and these huge creatures that we conjure up in special effects but part of the reason we do that i think is because there really were species that really were big and we really did need to pay a lot of attention to them because it really was uh, part of the basis of our survival, both to you know, be safe from them and maybe to eat them too. So uh, they say humans were one of the main reasons that the mammoths went extinct, humans hunted mammoths. So that's the great American interchange between North and South America. And again, the Central America played the role of a filter corridor. I also want to note here that we said that it's a filter, meaning some species can get through and some can't. And one of the exceptions to that, like what, what, what has an easier time getting through? And one of the answers is birds. Birds can fly, right? So they have an easier time getting through. And, um, but also birds, um, you know, you might think, I used to think, well, birds can just kind of go out wherever they want to go because they can fly. But no, actually, they found that, yes, they can fly, but they usually hang out close to land. They don't, you, most birds don't fly out far over the ocean just for kicks. They, they stay over where land is. And so even if they could fly out further, they're going to kind of hug Central America up and down north and south. And that comes into play when you talk about plant species. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, so, for example, and you go to a place like Costa Rica or Panama or Central America in general, you see all different types of plants, all bundled up, bunched up together, you know, like huge leaves, needle, you know, evergreen plants, all kinds of plants. And it's a, how did this array of plants get here? All this, you know, very, very, very high level of uh, plant diversity. And one of the ways is because birds will eat seeds and then the birds can fly up and down central america and then they go to the bathroom and they you know the seeds come out and the seeds go all over the ground and so the seeds can be transported long distances through birds stomachs basically birds you know gastrointestinal systems and come out the other side so birds help to spread seeds of plants all throughout central america which helps to make it this extremely diverse place that it is today when it comes to phytodiversity or plant diversity. So we have zoogeography and then we have phytogeography, which is uh, plant geography. Okay, so that's one way that, that they affect each other. The zoogeography affects plant geography because birds can uh, deposit seeds in faraway places and that spreads plants over long distances. And then in a circular way, those plants then become part of the filter corridor for other species of animals. So from a filter corridor, which is difficult to get through, but some species can get through, we have an even further level of corridor, a sweepstakes corridor or a sweepstakes route. This is a relatively newer classification of wildlife corridors. So imagine some species is trying to get from point A to point B, like in Madagascar. Here. How, we, we asked earlier, how does species get from Africa to Madagascar? That's, it's a long distance, right? How does, does a lemur just you know swim for 100 something kilometers? How did that happen? And what they believe now is that those species, or many of those species in Madagascar, got there by random chance, right? They crossed that strait right there by, for example, falling into some natural boat or natural raft. 
a piece of wood or a coconut shell, something like that. And coconut shells do actually travel for long distances. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the co coconut shells can travel for thousands of miles around the world. And so they're one of the most uh, common sort of natural vessels. They just float, float, float all the way around the world. But in this case, we have the lemur, and which is now many different types of lemurs, but they believe that they, along with other species that ended up in Madagascar, somehow fell into natural rafts, some sort of objects that then floated across to Madagascar. And it's amazing, not only that they fell in, but then they stayed in and then they survived the journey across. So it's a very interesting theory. And they call that the idea of a sweepstakes corridor. Sweepstakes because a sweepstakes is like a contest. You know, we have a drawing, you pick a name out of a hat or, you know, a winner. So it's just luck. It's just random chance. Who fell into the natural boat and who ended up on the other side? So now that we've looked at as many zoo regions and we've seen some of the wildlife corridors that species can take to go from one place to another. Today, one of the biggest issues uh, to do with the animal movements is with humans disrupting wildlife corridors. And it's a natural occurrence when you have a population explosion of the world from just in the last couple of hundred years from 1 billion to now 7 and 8 billion. So obviously, you're going to be creating many more urban environments and paving over many more roads and highways. And so you're going to disrupt wildlife. What do you do about it? And in this picture, you can see, you know, a relatively simple example of you can you can make your own wildlife corridor to replace the one that you disconnected. So you get species on either side of these forests here and disconnected by that highway, but you can kind of put it back together again through this sort of uh, natural bridge on the top, this green bridge where species can kind of walk across to the other side. There's a really interesting example of a, uh, a study of a, of, in Canada of a golf course where there was wolves that needed to go back and forth between the forest and the mountains. The mountains were here and then the forest was over here and they needed to go back and forth between where they, they lived and then where they ate out in the forest, they chased stuff down and ate. And so this golf course was inconveniently built right between those two and cut the wolves off between the mountains and the forest so they couldn't go back and forth. And so what did they do? Uh, they built a corridor. They built like sort of a giant hallway, like a, I think a fence, like a mesh fence or something like that, right through the middle of the golf course and hoping that wolves would figure it out and then just, you know, start walking back and forth through through the golf course and having no, you know, nothing in there, no humans or anything in, in the corridor to, to you know, deter the wolves from coming through. And they put cameras and they measured how many wolves, you know, come through and after a while first the first wolf like kind of like you know figured out oh, i can go through here let me try you know then it was one it was two and it was three four five and six seven eight all of a sudden after months and years then lots of wolves started going back and forth so they were able to successfully reconnect the mountain habitat where the wolves live with their uh, habitat for eating in the in the woods and the forest on the other side right through the middle of this golf course so that was an example of a successful use of an artificial wildlife corridor that is not the same as it was before, but does the job. So that's a look at zoogeography. I encourage you to pick a species, look up its range. It could be any animal. To me, it's always fascinating to see the range of where a species begins and ends on the earth. Um, maybe look up Alfred Russell Wallace, see all the different crazy things that he did in his life. He went to many, many places. And and also you could look up where species originated and then where they are now. Some of the common species that we think of as being from this place or from that place, oftentimes it turns out that they actually originated somewhere really far from there, perhaps even on the other side of the world. So that's always a fascinating thing to explore.